Briar answered, but yeah. Ah, oh, there he is. Ah, oh, he's here, yeah. We have the, the, the idea. Hi, hi, sorry, my, my computer restarted and I recording is underway. Stefan, it's all yours. Okay, welcome everybody to the final day of the Jetscape School. Uh, uh, today penul is... Penultimate day, sorry. We have one more day. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, we okay. have tomorrow. To the penultimate day of the Jetscape School. Uh, today's topic is hadronization, and our lead speaker is Rainer Fries from Texas A&M. Uh, just the usual reminder, if you have questions, we have a Slack channel for today. It's labeled July 27-hadronization. And you can also put your questions into the chat or raise raise a hand in, in Zoom. And I will then call on you to, to ask your question. And Reiner has also dedicated you know, stops along the way and a Q&A session after the talk uh, for questions. So you've got plenty of opportunities. Make the most out of them. And I am going to turn it over to Reiner to uh, start his presentation. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Stefan, uh, for the nice introduction. Welcome, everybody, to today's session on hadronization. I believe it's actually the first time we have a dedicated lecture and actually hands-on on hadronization. So I'm excited about that since I've worked uh, a bit on that. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. So um, here's the plan for today, sort of for the next hour or maybe hour 15, if we include the Q&A session. So I wanted to discuss a little bit generally about the the, the, the challenges of hadronization, right? And why we actually need to worry about it. Um, then I wanna go a little bit like one slide each basically about the different models that are sort of on the market. So I call this how to make hadrons in five different ways. Okay, I have some nasty sound in my earpiece. Is that just on my computer? No, that's for me as well. Let me I hear that as well. Okay, sound is gone. Okay. All right. Okay, I'll just uh, continue. I hope it didn't originate from my uh, microphone here. All right. Um, okay, so how to make hadrons in five different ways. Um, then I will focus on the model, which um, sort of I've worked on the most, maybe naturally, uh, which is also in Jetscape. And you'll spend some time in the hands-on sessions also working with that, which is the model is hybrid hadronization. Um, so and there's first sort of a more general, like sort of formalism-based uh, uh, chapter. And then um, I'll talk about hadronization specifically in Jetscape and Xscape, which, uh, well, there's actually three different models right now, which you could choose from. All right, so hadronization um, is, well, <laughs> a difficult topic. Um, and uh, people have worked on this for, I guess, now 50 years. I mean, basically since QCD um, originated, right? So um, if you take the QCD Lagrange and you have fundamental degrees of freedoms, which are quarks and gluons, but we don't see them in the world around us, okay? So like in many other theories, so you have um, sort of bound states as the lowest possible states, um, you know, in a universe that is now relatively cool. Um, but unlike some of the other theories like electrodynamics, um, there's an additional complication, which is confinement. So um, in QED, um, forming the bound state is sort of optional. You can have, even at very low temperatures, you can have um, free protons and you can have free electrons uh, moving around. But in QCD, that is not an option. So you cannot have things that are not color singlets, basically, like free quarks or free gluons, um, things need to be confined in um, color singlet objects. So um, that that makes it a little bit uh, a little bit uh, harder than to to really even like think about experiments uh, in QCD, right? Because um, if you do experiments, you start out with a bound state. And, um, you know, maybe in, in between, in some intermediate stage, you deal with quarks and gluons, um, and, but in the end, what comes into into your detector with the thing that you that you can finally uh, track there and measure uh, the momentum and, and the energies of um, again has to be a bound state, right? So 
um, there is no way that, like if you do a QD based experiment, that there will be some photons in the end that just escape and you can you can measure them. Um, you don't have the same thing with gluons in QCD. So they always have to turn into, into bound states. And so we need to know how to describe the process, right? Um, you might have heard that you can win a million bucks uh, US <laughs> uh, from the Clay Foundation if you uh, actually solve confinement as a mathematical problem. It's really not understood uh, um, sort of analytically, but uh, of course we sort of, we, we know it's there from phenomenological um, studies. And we can also see, for example, on lattice QCD, right? So there is, uh, um, there are these famous lattice plots where they basically put two relatively heavy quarks on the, on the lattice and then they measure uh, the potential of the free energy or so as a function of different distances. And then you see that um, unlike um, um, a, a cooler potential, which sort of, um, you know, would, would, would vanish or, or not rise sort of forever uh, as a function of distance, you, you find that um, you have an energy that basically goes to infinity. So these are um, um, such, such lattice measurements and they are for different temperatures. Of course, you know that um, if you go above the critical temperature that you can make confinement go away. That's the purpose of heavy ion collisions. But so you see here uh, sort of uh, directly uh, what happens if you, with the interaction between uh, quarks or you know relatively heavy quarks, if or a quark and a quark pair actually, um, if you increase the temperature, right? So if you have a low temperature, the lowest here is about 0.66. So that would be the uh, the red, um, what's the red curve? And um, then 1.15 times TC, that's the green curve. You see how this potential that sort of goes up and up and up sort of uh, uh, breaks down and becomes more cooler like eventually, right? And um, the, the way to understand this phenomenologically, not really exactly sort of from first principle, but sort of phenomenolo phenomenologically is that the potential is shaped like um, shown on that graph here, sort of to the, to the right. It's also sometimes called the Cornell potential um, that you sort of have, um, I don't know if you can see my, uh, my mouse pointer here. Okay. That you, um, so you um, actually let me, there's a better way, right? Uh, here, okay. So hopefully you see the laser pointer. Um, there is there's sort of this this cooler like part um, at small distance so distances. So if your quark and your antiquark are very close together, it actually feels a little bit like electrodynamics, okay? But then instead of sort of flattening out, um, there is actually this other part where this potential becomes linear, and that's the string part. Um, so that's what, what we call this, the string part. And you can actually model it with this. Um, if you want a simple phenomenological model, you can actually write down a potential like this with a Coulomb part and a, and a linear part. And then there's this string breaking part here that we're also uh, getting to. Uh, it's, it's very simple because everything is sort of relativistic. Once you have enough energy in there, you know, two times mc squared, where m is some particle that you could produce, then you can actually, instead of putting more energy into the string, the string can break by um, by popping particles out of the vacuum. Um, the the emergence of these strings, again, just on a phenological uh, basis, can be understood um, also from you know sort of a good old field line picture that you also have for electrodynamics, right? So if you have your quark and your antiquark close together, then uh, the field lines are a bit like you would have it in electrodynamics with a dipole. Um, but then if you pull these apart, um, there's a property of the QCD vacuum, which is sort of um, similar to a superconductor that tries to expel magnetic field lines. You have sort of this expulsion of electric field lines from the QCD vacuum. And that squeezes the, the field lines together uh, into these tubes, into these flux tubes. And then you see sort of the, the string picture of, of QCD um, emerge in front of your eyes if you sort of uh, start from this uh, cooler light picture at, at small distances and then you go to long distances and these field lines become these flux tubes, okay? Um, and again, um, if you put in a lot of energy, so that's where, first of all, that's where this linear rise comes from in the, in the potentials are very different the behavior then from um, what, you, what you're used to from electrodynamics. And um, so again, if you if you put in too much energy into the system, what will happen is that 
somewhere here in the middle, you can just pop another QQ bar pair um, out of the vacuum, uh, right? So once you have enough energy, so uh, <clears throat> even if you put more and more energy into that string, at some point you'll just break it and it becomes two strings and you'll never have really a free quark. So that, that's basically the principle. Okay, um, <clears throat> all right, so now, so, so this is a challenge, right? Because um, if there's no first principle calculation, um, we need to model it. And um, so I, I sort of like these, this picture. This is something that you find in one of the recent uh, Pythia manuals. Um, and it's sort of, uh, I, the, the reason I like it is uh, because if you sort of think of this as sort of the second part of an interaction, it could be in PP or AA going on sort of, so from the, you know, if you, if you start sort of with the hard process, uh, forget about what's before, which is, also interesting, of course, and important. But if you think about all the final state interactions between partons, maybe there's final state showers and so on. And at some point, um, there is this, uh, okay, my computer is sort of lagging here. Uh, can everybody still hear me just fine? I don't wanna talk into a vacuum. Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Okay, all right. Um, if I try to move my laser pointer here now, it's, uh, it's very slow, I don't know. Um, anyway, so let me proceed. Never mind the laser pointer right now, it's just jumping. Uh, but <laughs> I wanted to point at this circle that you see there, which is basically uh, all the stuff that has to do with hydrization, right? And um, it's like a shell around all the like real QCD stuff, as some people would say, you know, the PQCD stuff that's inside, okay? Um, so you have this sort of this hydrization going out and then on the outside of that, uh, you have sort of the hadrons and the hadronic decays, and eventually all these things go into your detector. So you, you have to, you have to sort of break up with that shell, or somehow at least understand how that works, right? Uh, the processes that that go on uh, during that phase to really um, translate what you measure in those hadrons into whatever is going on at the parton side, right? Um, okay, so um, we have to model it. There's there's basically no other way. So um, and that's what people have done for the last uh, basically uh, 40 or so years. So what does a uh, model need to have, right? Um, well, obviously, you know, observe all relevant observation laws. I mean, obviously energy momentum, um, as much of the QCD symmetries that, that you can pack in there. Uh, it should enforce confinement. So that's, that's important. So basically that means your model, if, you, if somebody gives you a bunch of quarks and gluons, uh, that comes out of a Monte Carlo, you need to completely uh, translate them into hadrons, right? Um, and um, if you can implement phenomenological properties of QCD, I mean, for example, the hadron spectrum, I mean, that would be an obvious one. You want to implement the correct hadron spectrum. It's not, not nothing that you predict from your hadronization model. It's something that you put in. So so that's what uh, people have done. And uh, well, well, we'll see um, how, they, how they work. Okay. Um, are there any questions at this point um, before I move on to the next slide? No here? question from Salak, so you can, uh, no, select, no, no question from Salak. Okay, okay. Also nothing here. All right, so feel free to post questions on Slack. So I have a slide on, on uh, SU3 color, which I put in this introduction chapter here because, um, yeah, I don't know where else it would have fit nicely, but um, so it is something that um, we're going to need a little bit later on when we try to understand, you know, what's happening with strings in Monte Carlos. So obviously, um, I'm, you know, most of you will know that QCD is based on uh, a gauge symmetry and the symmetry group is SU3, okay? Um, and um, well, we have to worry about it, but on the other hand, we, uh, we don't really wanna know what is the result of you know, sort of the color result of a scattering, right? So, because our world is white, so white mean, meaning color singlets. So we deal with these bound states. So we always can sort of sum over average, whatever the appropriate uh, thing is in the initial final state over colors, which leads then to color factors in your perturbative calculations. Um, and um, in, in, in Monte Carlos, in, in, in uh, say, a part on Monte Carlo or something like Pythia or Matter, 
Um, so you can implement those um, those in cross section. So if you have a process and you sample some cross section, you can also implement those color factors. But it is sometimes useful, and in particular for some of the hydronization models, you also want to track um, not sort of not 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 only sort of these um, averages, you know, average strengths for processes that come from these color factors, but you really want to trace sort of an orientation in that SU three space and. Uh, so um, the the approximation and the sort of the agreement um, that that we have is that we do this uh, with these color tags, which are sort of in an um, if you think about S U N with n equal three um, as the color group, um, sort of in, in some kind of n to infinity limit. Um, so instead of basically having three directions, okay, you have uh, in principle infinitely many, uh, and you just label them with with some integer numbers, and that's how it is done, for example, in Pythia. Uh, sometimes this is also called the Lesouche um, Accord. And um, sort of the way it works is um, that if you if you think about a process like the one shown here, let me see if my, okay, so now my laser pointer, I have control of it again, very nice. So if you think about a simple process like the uh, a quark splitting off a gluon, right? Um, so there are these Gelman matrices that um, that you would put in a perturbative calculation here at this vertex, right? And uh, um, the, the matrices are shown here, and these are called lambda. So there's factors of one half between the Ts and the lambdas, but um, so um, the ones that I found quickly to grab yesterday were the, the ones with the labeled lambdas here. So um, uh, never mind that, it's just um, factors, but the structure of these uh, is what is shown here. So um, what they encode is sort of the behavior um, of the color quantum number, right? So uh, what one could, under, um, or the one way of uh, how one can understand this is with these kind of uh, color flow diagrams, right? Where sort of a quark has sort of a color flow line and I just, you know, just randomly assign, uh, instead of an index, you know, the color being an index here, J, which is um, for the quark field that is contracted. So the I and J and A are indices here on this on this matrix. Um, you think of uh, sort of this as, say, being a blue quark, right? And then you come to this vertex, and the way um, this 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 works is that you have to sort of create a new color anti-color pair. In this case, I just decided this to be red and anti-red, okay? And uh, the blue also goes on, and then you have this gluon, and the gluon is sort of uh, uh, part of a uh, color anti-color. So if you take a, this triplet and the anti-triplet, there's sort of an, an octet in there that those are the gluons and then there's the color singlets um and uh so so you can sort of view the the, the gluons as having one color and one anti-color right and so the the process is one sort of of a blue quark turning into a red quark and there's sort of a blue anti-red gluon uh also leaving the sort of the scene of that uh interaction right and um the way you keep track of this now in a shower monte carlo like Pythia matter is that uh, you would assign these color tags, um, and you see that the colors, the, the really orientations in color space uh, are sort of tracked by these integer numbers here. And whenever you come, say, to a vertex here, you just create a new one, okay? Um, that's sort of the end to infinity or part of this end to infinity limit that, in a sense, you, you treat this as an infinite reservoir of, of uh, directions, okay? So it's clear that you lose some sort of correlations between colors because really there's... So, Symmetry group is smaller. Um, excuse me, but so this is how it is done, and this has been sort of um, sufficient to sort of track color singlets. That's that's how we're going to um, to use it later, and you know to build things uh, like complicated string systems, uh, like like junctions. Okay. Okay. So uh, that's something that I want you to keep in mind a little bit. Uh, sort of these color tags, they will play a role later when we talk about strings. All right, so um, let's, I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, maybe I should have waited until this slide uh, before I ask. So let me just ask again, any any questions before I move on to the second part? So far, I don't see any in on the flag. So All right. Yeah. Nothing on Zoom either. Okay. All right, so Hadron's five different ways. <laughs> um, and I want to start with something that we usually never even think about. Well, there are people that think about it, but um, I think a lot of people don't even think about this anymore. But um, we actually, there is actually sort of a sort of first principle way. Well, 
there will be a second almost first principle way uh, of doing hydrogenation also in the next slide, but um, there is sort of a way um, to think about hydronization um, if we if we sort of in this large time, large volume limit of QCD where we where we don't track track individual protons and then individual hadrons, right? So we are just interested in like average thermodynamic quantities. Then we know how to do that because we know how to um, how to calculate an equation of state uh, on on the lattice. Okay, so if you think that is enough first principle for you. Um, then at least you know there's there's some kind of uh, approximation, well defined approximation to the real world or the real world QCD um, in numerics. <clears throat> then we know how to do this because um, you can just take a fluid dynamic calculations, right? The relativistic fluid dynamics, say to describe the bulk of an heavy ion collision, and um, all the, the all, uh, you know all that hydronization is doing to these average quantities is encoded here in this uh, equation of state. And maybe if you have viscous uh, fluid dynamics, maybe there's also some transport coefficients that, need, that you need to track uh, across uh, uh, TC. So, you know, if, if you go then, if you go away from that limit in a sense, then you have to track more and more, more and more things. But in principle, uh, it's doable. And that's of course why fluid dynamics is so nice. Uh, imagine running a, a parton cascade rather, a transport model for your parton side. Then you have to worry about taking each of these quarks and gluons that describes the bulk and somehow turning them into hadrons, right? And there are people and there are models, you know, like bumps or PHSD and, and so on that are out there, which, uh, you know, where people have to, to think about this. Um, but in fluid dynamics, um, it's sort of, it's, well, a lot of people have uh, worked very hard on this, but it's now very easy to do this. So you have the equation of state and, um, now, of course, what you get are all these average quantities, um, but you can turn them into hadrons if you if you run events by doing a sampling later on of some hypersurface, right? So that's how it is usually done. So, um, and uh, yeah, but I would say that is also one part, one one sort of one very valid approach to 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 hadronization, and that's also why um, in in Jetscape and Xscape, looking forward to the applications already um, for the for the soft bulk, we basically always use uh, um, at, at, at higher temperatures, at least, we use fluid dynamics, right? And then we don't have to worry about um, these complicated models that I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit, these other models to, to really apply them to, to the bulk, okay? All right, so um, the other thing I want to mention, which is also not really relevant for our Monte Carlo so much, but historically it's been very important is uh, sort of fragmentation or um, independent, what some people call independent fragmentation. Um, and um, it's also worthwhile mentioning because it's sort of, again, um, a little bit better based on first principles because for some processes, there are uh, factorization theorems in QCD um, that sort of neatly separate um, a hard process that you can compute in perturbative QCD and then all the long distance behavior, which by the way, includes basically um, um, some of the final state, um, uh, so, some of the final state radiation and everything that we would in a Monte Carlo actually also calculate based on um, on sort of perturbative uh, considerations, right? So I think I have that further down here, um, sort of to, to show that what is called a fragmentation factor function actually is hydronization plus some of the final state parton physics as well. Um, and, but the advantage is that uh, you can sort of, there's a, a clean definition in terms of, you know, some matrix element that you um, that, that you define. So these are called, um, historically they were called part on decay functions. Um, now it's, they're more often called fragmentation functions. So it's really, so if you turn a quark, uh, if you sort of run, start reading here, you have a quark that you annihilate. So this is for a quark. And instead you create, um, <clears throat> you create a, a a hadron. So it's a process of, of turning a single, in this case, quark, you can do it also for a gluon that comes out of a hard process, turning it into a, into a hadron, okay? Actually turning it into a bunch of hadrons, um, but this is sort of a measurement uh, or it's most appropriate for um, a, a process where um, you just measure one hadron, okay? So you're not very, uh, you're not very um, inclusive in a sense that, uh, 
that you're sort of, um, you know, measuring everything. All right, so um, yeah, so and, and this happens as a function of some momentum fraction that the hydron has uh, with respect to the uh, with respect to the uh, original quark or the original parton. Okay, um, so it's most appropriate <clears throat> really to use for um, things like um, um, deep elastic scattering um, and uh, you know production of uh, of hydrons and. In deep plastic scattering, or maybe also in in PP collisions, um, but in principle, you can you as a model on the on the basis of treating that just as a model, not as something very first principle. You could apply it to other situations as well. Now, these um, just as a as a last comment here, these fragmentation functions, they have a very clean definition, similar very similar to PDFs, uh, but unlike PDFs, it's basically impossible to, for technical reasons, to calculate them on the lattice. So all the information comes basically from experiments. So they are universal objects. You can um, uh, measure them, for example, in the plus and minus, uh, uh, plus and minus collisions. And here's a compilation of that and, 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 and uh, sort of fit them. And um, you, then you can reuse them for other processes because of their universality. Um, so that's another way of dealing with this. So using these sort of universal objects called fragmentation functions to turn Sort of single partons into into hadrons, but for Monte Carlo, uh, so for our purposes, where we usually really want to treat um, collisions completely, um, it's also not really the right thing. Okay, let's uh, move on to another one, which is um, uh, the first one, really. That is for our purposes. If you think about jets and and parton showers, like it's very very much in use actually. Um, not just not in jetscape really, but um, I just for completeness put a slide here. Um, so that's called cluster hydronization. It's also it's it's been around for a long time. Um, so this is now really one that is um, you know primarily sort of intended to to be used for for jet Monte Carlos. Okay. So the input, just like with um, the next ones that we have, are basically fully developed parton showers. Uh, so something like this. So if so if you have um, if you if you think about um, for example e plus and minus um, as a process, right? You create a QQ bar pair. The QQ bar pair um, of, of both the quark and the antiquark uh, develop a final state shower, and then what you do is um, you form clusters, as the name as the name says. So, so what's a cluster? Well, um, you take sort of the quarks and antiquarks. If you have gluons, you force those to sort of split in some uh, non-perturbative way, like like shown here, into a QQ bar pair. We'll see that. Um, uh, appear as well in, um, in in hybrid hydronization later. We also have to do that. Um, recombination usually doesn't have gluons, so we have to force uh, gluons to to decay into quarks and antiquarks. It will be interesting. Uh, you know, that's not an official homework, but you can try to compare all of these models and see. You know, what are what are connections between them? The next the next three. So starting with this one, right? And uh, you know, what are the differences and and the and the connections between them? So um, there, so based on a concept called local color neutrality, and one can sort of understand it from these um, the, this, this, these color flow considerations that I um, mentioned earlier. Um, there, there is sort of if if quarks are close together to each other, sort of in terms of that they're sort of uh, neighbors from the splittings, then their color they they should be color singlet. So there should be this local color neutrality. So um, if you if you put all the energy and the momentum that um, sort of a QQ bar pair has here uh, together into an object, which you just call a cluster, then you end up with these things which have typically like, um, you know, a few GV of energy and are, they're color neutral. And um, then the idea is just to say, well, I have some kind of blob of energy and, 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 and momentum. And um, I let that decay into hadrons, like in terms of almost like a statistical hadronization, which I don't have a, an extra slide on, but uh, so there's that concept of hadron sort of just being spit out um, into a, into some kind of uh, in some kind of equilibrium fashion, and in a sense, in this is applied to to these clusters here. So in in detail, it can be more complicated. I think there can be you know clusters can fission before they decay and so on, and then there's typically um, also um, you know you create all kind of excited hadrons that need to decay, but that's the same also for the other. 
for the other models. Um, so that, that's sort of the gist of it, okay? So um, there are some, um, as I said, you can try to trace similarities and differences between the models. There are some, there, there are some interesting, um, there's some interesting overlap generally with the idea of recombination in particular, if uh, you go and allow recombination into very highly excited uh, hadrons at first, very ex highly excited hadron resonances, uh, because then are, they're almost like, uh, you know, if, if you have stuff of a few GV mass, they're almost like these clusters again, right? So, um, so this has been implemented in Herbic, for example. Um, there's no cluster ionization really in, uh, in, in Jetscape. So I just, yeah, wanted to mention that sort of for, uh, for um, completeness. Um, so right now, yeah. so we have a question from uh, question from uh, Slack. So we have two questions. So one. Okay. Is from yeah. Go ahead. Why so, don't you read them? Okay. So so that is uh, that is for the uh, that is about slide ten. So the previous slide. This one. Yeah. About mm -hmm. the fragmentation function. So what kind of observable? Uh, what kind of observable input do you take from different experiments to calculate these fragmentation okay. functions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Right. So I maybe I rushed a little bit uh, to this. So. Um, they're supposed to be, so for the processes for which these factorization theorems have been proven, um, they're supposed to be universal in a sense that um, if you write down a cross-section, so, so here's, for example, um, say a PP collision, um, I should explain this a little bit, so the blue, say, are two protons that come together. You take, um, you know, partons, um, the small a and small b are partons, there's some kind of scattering between the partons, a bunch of stuff is coming out, but you're tracing in particular one quark or gluon coming out, and that one turns into a hadron, right? <clears throat> so this kind of semi, uh, semi inclusive uh, production of, of a hadron, that, that would be an example, but the cleanest is simply E plus and minus. So where, uh, si similar to what was shown in the, in the Herbie example. So where you have uh, uh, simply, you start basically with a virtual photon that decays into two quarks or a quark and an antiquark, right? And then again, you have this process of a single, say, quark uh, decaying in some way into a hadron. It's actually a bunch of hadrons, but you only measure one, okay? Um, and then you have this, uh, uh, that is described sort of by the, in all of these processes by the same operator, by the same matrix element of an operator. Um, but then the question remains, so what is the most effective way of measuring it, uh, even if you can use it later on? The, the most effective because the most cleanest way is in the plus and minus. And you really basically just look at uh, this quantity here, which is uh, d sigma dx, where x is basically like a momentum fraction of squared s over two, which is the uh, sort of the, the energy that you sort of know if it's if it's a two back-to-back -back jets, right? Uh, two or two back-to-back -back, uh, quarks originally, a quark and an anti-quark again. Um, Sort of, you you calculate the fraction sort of that this hadron would have. Um, there is a difference. Uh, I don't know what it is here. It's probably xp. There's an xp uh, and an xc sort of a fraction of momentum of energy. But um, so no matter the detail here. So basically, what if you look at this? This is the fragmentation function, like the shapes that you see here. That's a fragmentation function as a function of what I call z here. It's called x, but uh, that's it because the momentum of the the momentum of the of the quark is sort of fixed, right? And that tells you why this is preferable over, say, anything in PP, because in PP the the initial momentum of that of that part only is never fixed, right? It could be uh, anything coming out of this hot process here, right? Uh, so it's always uh, there's a folding over an integration over all the the part of momenta here. Um, e plus and minus is experimentally clean, but also theoretically it's sort of very clean. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Okay, so basically look at these as, frag as fragmentation functions. So I took this out of the PDG, the discussion about fragmentation functions. You can find that that plot there. Okay. Um, um, actually, uh, we have two more. So one okay. is from Ishmael about uh, cluster harmonization. So okay. does the cluster harmonization work only for quarks, meaning all gluon have to be turned into quarks before harmonization? Um, I, I think, yes, I think that's what's enforced. I mean, I never really looked at, I'm not an expert. I have to put out the claim on cluster ionization. Uh, I've also just learned uh, about this from, you know, some papers and some presentations. But yes, I think the, um, 
you, you always basically decay, like force the gluons to decay uh, into QQ bar pairs. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's certainly justifiable as some kind of, um, you know, there's no valence gluons in a sense in, in, in hadrons. At least that's how you would justify it in recombination, where we also do it. Um, and, you know, it's sort of naturally uh, 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 an extrapolation of the things that, that you're already doing, the perturbative shower, right? Where you also would have a Q, pot, uh, potentially a gluon to QQ bar, um, um, you know, process, a perturbative one. And moreover, now, if you worry about, um, you know, does a gluon have enough mass? So indeed, you, you have to give masses to these gluons, but they come out of hard processes typically with... Uh, with some virtuality that you can basically interpret as a mass. Mm -hmm. And uh, perturbative um, evolution is usually stopped around the GV or so. Uh, so it will be easy to, to decay those gluons into, um, into QQ bars. So my understanding is yes. So they always decay uh, gluons. So we have uh, another one uh, from uh, Lavindra. Uh, so in independent fragmentation, uh, does mm -hmm. a single quark require any field to form a hadron? I'm not sure how a single quark form a hadron, maybe yeah. because of the ca color yes. uh, condition or something. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Okay, so um in, <clears throat> okay, so all you do if you if you sort of uh, look at this is you you sort of have um you know, you have a quark and a, and a hadron, you calculate the overlap sort of of that in a sense, right? Or um, th there's a way of turning that these creation and relation operators for the hadrons also into a into a state, um, into sort of bras and kets, and then have sort of an overlap between vacuum and a hadron, and you have a, a quark operator in between. Um, so you don't ask what else is happening. So of course, the microscopic model would be that this, uh, that this quark here, a gluon, Builds up a final state shower, and then that shower, you know, if you think about multiplicities in the plus and minus, so each of these showers has probably, you know, if it's a decent energy of tens of GV, each of these showers probably uh, creates, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine hadrons, and you just measure one of those, okay? And moreover, because you start out of a quark, um, that cannot never be a complete process. It needs to be sort of a color singlet as if it's a whole process so it's connected to something else as well okay just as a side note but even that one quark it will probably create seven eight nine hadrons ten hadrons <clears throat> and then you just measure one of them okay and you ask sort of what's the probability to finding right it's a game of statistics and again what's the probability of finding that hadron which then has a fraction of the energy of the original quark uh you know with that momentum fraction there so um so the claim is not that it's one quark goes directly into just one hadron, right? So that's that's not going to happen. Uh, think of it as a as a PDF, where also you it's really in a sense the inverse process. So you have a you have a parton and that uh, sorry you have a, say a proton, um, so a hadron, um, and you just measure you try to measure one say what's the probability you find one quark in there, one gluon with a given momentum fraction, right? But of course, you know, there's many more quarks of gluons there, okay? And similar here, there will be many more hadrons, but you just uh, write down an operator and, you know, philologically, um, you sort of do statistics and say, oh, what's the probability to find <clears throat> to find one of these hadrons there, say, a pion in an up quark, uh, you know, in a shower that is initiated by an up quark. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Okay, should I move on? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I don't see okay. any reactions. Okay, perfect. Yeah, no, it's it's good. Let's let's talk about all of these uh, questions that you might have. Um, that's, that's a good discussion. All right, so now let's inch closer to uh, the things that are also done in Jetscape. So let's talk about string fragmentation a little bit, okay? Um, because that is, uh, again, it's something that was sort of invented for Jets. Um, but it's of uh, you can apply it also to you know if you have in Prithia, if you have an underlying event, um, it's also hadronized with, with jets, and that's already mentioned it. So that that's something that the Lund group, um, you know, and and all the people they worked with elsewhere um, have, of course, uh, they really put their stamp on that and and made it theirs. So it was in Jetset, which is sort of the, uh, the 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 predecessor of Prithia. Now it's in in Prithia, and uh, so what you do is you 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 exactly. Uh, keep track of these color tags that 
um, are created um, during you know perturbative processes and uh, final state showers and so on. And you keep track in particular of color singlet configurations. And um, you basically, the idea is that, okay, so you have, you know, here's, here's a quark, um, to do this within the frame of my camera. Here's a quark coming out of a hard process. Here's an anti-quark coming out of this hard process. They have the same color tag. So one has, well, one has it as a color tag, one has it as an anti-color tag. I didn't actually mention explicitly, but maybe it was clear from the example that, uh, you know, quarks sort of get color tags. Uh, the uh, anti-quarks get anti-color tags and gluons have both of them, one color, one anti-color, right? So that's, uh, if you've ever looked at a, you know, sort of the parton listing in Prithia, they, they are, um, they are, these color tags are there. And um, so so then what you know, if, if, if they have the same quark, uh, sorry, the same, you know, color tag on one hand and the anti-color tag on the other hand, they have to form a color singlet. So there's a string between them. So it goes back now to what we discussed earlier. So these are two, a quark and an anti-quark that um, interact with each other. And if they are sort of getting far away from each other, because now it's the end of the process, everything is streaming out, they're getting further and further away from each other, they feel that string between between uh, each other, right? That's what the the what now um, sort of governs the dynamics, and uh, it's shown here uh, in this in this uh, little diagram here that I, I borrowed from somebody else's presentation. Um, so suppose there is a QQ bar pair created. I mean that this could be e plus e minus again, with you know the original uh, the e plus e, uh, the e minus and the photon not being shown here. Um, one of the, so this is the anti-quark, it also emits a gluon. So um, you, you can follow now the color flow with what I um, explained before. So suppose originally there was a color tag 100 and 100 bar created here. Then the 100 bar, um, there's another, because of there's a quark gluon vertex, there's another pair of color tags that you create, 100, 101 and 101 bar. And then you end up with this configuration. So there's um, 100, then there's a gluon with 100 bar and 101, and then there is a 101 bar. Um, as uh, I'll explain again later, or, or mention again later, so as long as all these color tags come in pairs, so one, one, you know, there's one, uh, so if each color tag has a matching anti-color tag, uh, it's a color singlet configuration, right? So, and you see that the string here neatly fits in and uh, sort of it adds, um, energy momentum to the string, sometimes it's referred to as a, as a, as a kink, okay, because it's sort of, uh, well, uh, you can you can think of this really as strings being, uh, if you think about this as strings being uh, drawn between, say, quark and anti-quark, then the gluons are sort of additional prongs that, that sort of hold up that string, okay. Um, so just, um, just very generally, um, <clears throat> so, so what can these strings look like? So they can, start or end on quarks and anti-quarks. There's also di-quarks in principle in, in, in Pythia. So uh, because uh, um, a, a, a di-quark, so like a, say an up and down quark together, uh, they can again make um, an anti, so these are quarks, but in terms of color, they can make an anti-triplet again. So you just treat it in terms of color like an anti-quark then, the di-quark, okay? Um, or they can connect to um, a junction or anti-junction, and I'm going to to talk about this uh, probably now. So, so what are what are junctions? So, junctions are objects that um, that actually carry um, carry a barrier number or an anti-barrier number. So, um, because if you think about a Q and a Q bar as sort of something that already looks pretty much like a meson, right? A Q Q bar string. Um, then the question is, but how do you implement a baryon? Uh, in terms of the the color and also the you know the this particular implementation with the color tags, so um, a, a barrier like say um, a proton with its two up quarks and a down quark, um, how do they fit into this picture? So the picture is that um, they form sort of this kind of uh, Mercedes star configuration. So basically, three strings um, coming together here in this well, it's called a junction aptly. Okay or three anti-quarks forming an anti-junction. Um, so if you look at Pythia, um, and you know how to read the uh, sort of the, uh, because it's a bit, bit tricky to, to actually get that information out of um, a, a, a Pythia listing, but uh, so Pythia has the ability to, to carry junction. And in fact, um, you know, 
a beam remnant might be a junction, or you can create junctions in other ways, but that's something that should be there and is there in, in Prithia. So, um, yeah, uh, and here, so it, once you have junctions, the if you want to check if something is is um, sort of a color singlet system, um, the uh, the matching of the color tags and anti-color tags doesn't work. So you have to separately sort of keep track of all the junctions and keep track of color tags that you know sort of form a color singlet. Okay, in in this in in this junction here. Um, by the way, these are only uh, sort of the simplest junction that you can think of. Each of these here, each of the legs can be, again, a string with many gluons attached or even other junctions attached. Okay. So, in fact, you can you can think about, um, again, this, this is still simple, but this is sort of a uh, junction, a, what is it, an anti-junction, junction, anti-junction anti system. Okay. So, the, the color algebra is... You know, it's perfectly fine. In fact, you can, you know, each of these legs, you can add uh, uh, an n number of gluons, and it's still fine. So you can make very difficult topologies with this um, that are in principle allowed. Um, it turns out Prithia cannot hadronize, um, you know, arbitrarily difficult uh, topologies. Uh, we've tried, so I can I can say that um, it it it's easy to make it sort of cuff and then and then give up. So uh, usually it stops with uh, dijunction. So it's a, like a junction and an anti-junction sort of together in some kind of, uh, you know, dumbbell uh, format. That That's fine for Pythia, but everything more complicated. If you get it out, and in hybridization we do sometimes, um, you have to manually intervene and just, just directly hadronize some of these junctions or anti-junctions. Uh, I mean, one way would be to... Uh, to sort of prematurely hadronize junctions and interjunctions yourself in your code before you hand over something to Prithia. Okay. Um, all right. So then, what's the actual? So so what happens now? I, I talked a lot about what sort of the possible junctions are, or the, sorry, the possible string systems. But what is actually done? Well, um, let let me just uh, uh, you know show sort of this. Well, we've sort of talked the, about the fact that if you put enough energy into a string. It will break. It will sort of create more particles, and that is shown here. There's sort of a um, a, a formula. There's sort of a, a, a sort of like a tunneling process um, of uh, you know pair creation um, in in the vacuum that is that is used there. Something similar to the Schrödinger formula, and uh, you end up with this, and then you basically just collapse these uh, you know these these much smaller systems that you have then into uh, into mesons or into sometimes if you have a, a dike work uh anti dike work pair that you create out of the vacuum from the string um you uh create a a baryon and an anti baryon so that is how, um, how that is done and um in hybridization as i will explain that we, we use that so string so hybrid means it's strings plus something else that i'm going to talk about next and uh so we use just the functions of prithia 8 here to um, uh, to break up these strings into hadrons then. And um, so we haven't really touched that part, but it's obviously so at, at the core of uh, this Lund, uh, uh, Lund string model, right? So, and all the parameters that come with it uh, when you do that. Okay, um, so I think that's all I wanted to talk about um, in terms of the, the string model. Um, then let me uh, do the last one of our, our five models and then maybe, um, Pause again for questions. So the last one I want to mention is quark recombination. And um, so you might ask, okay, so um, th these are all very nice models, but what about if I think about QED again, right? Um, so how do I form bound states in QED? So for example, um, one of the one of the um, processes that obviously um, you know, people, atomic physicists um, and cosmologists and so on had to think about a lot is, you know, this um, primordial recombination event, okay? And there's even the name uh, reco uh, recombination um, that happened about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, right? When the universe became uh, transparent because before you had a plasma of uh, protons and, and electrons and, you know, protons and some like nuclei and, and you had electrons. And then they formed hydrogen atoms and photons, that, that's a process. And, uh, you know, the universe was never the same again. Uh, well, luckily for us. 
And uh, so you can calculate that process. I mean, you just take your protons and your electrons and you calculate the process of, uh, you know, there's, there's papers, many papers written on that, uh, of them forming hydrogen atoms and, uh, and, and, and photons, right? And, and you, you all know this picture of this afterglow of that event. So can we not do just something similar? So we start out with just a bunch of quarks, uh, quarks and, and anti-quarks, say, okay? And we know mesons have a certain valence quark structure, okay? So um, again, the gluons are sort of uh, um, uh, listed here as complications because we somehow would have to get rid of gluons, but let's press on for now. So if we have that, why not just calculate the probability that say, you know, these three quarks here combine into a, into a, uh, a baryon, just like, you know, if you take a proton electron here, you can calculate the probability that they, Form a hydrogen, right? And you can do the same for QQ bar to form mesons and so on. So can we do that? Uh, so this would be called quark recombination or quark coalescence. So uh, if you hear coalescence or recombination, um, it's uh, I basically use them um, as equivalent uh, terms here in 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 this lecture. So um, it's it's a nice idea, right? But of course there are problems, right? So for example, confinement is not there in in you know when you form hydrogen atoms. Uh, we have gluons. Uh, moreover, you can you you can radiate photons here, and that's really what you're interested in in this process. Not an individual, you know, what the spectrum of hydrogen atoms is as much, but what the spectrum of photons is coming from this. You can't emit gluons here because gluons are also part of you know subject to confinement because they themselves have color charges, unlike photons that don't have electric charges, right? And uh, you know, there's something about mass generation because color symmetry breaks and things like that. So there are lots of um, uh, lots of potential difficulties. And in fact, you know, maybe those are some of the reasons why, even though um, people have tried recombination models just, you know, at the same time when some of the other models emerged, I mean, basically from the 70s. Um, but um, a lot of the experimental data is from systems that are very dilute, like E plus and minus, you know, EP, PP, those were... Um, the machines that QCD were, was was done on for the first 30, 25 or 30 years of QCD. And heavy ion sort of experiments existed, but uh, weren't at very high energies that, for example, jets were, were even relevant. But um, with the advent of RIC, um, these ideas got um, revived uh, for a number of reasons. And I just put two experimental uh, results out there. Um, that sort of support a recombination picture, just as I um, sort of roughly explained it. Um, we'll, we'll do a, a slightly more mathematical formulation in a few, a few slides from now. Um, so one was the large number of baryons that you get um, compared to mesons. Sometimes the ratio is one to one between baryons and mesons, as you can see, here. say protons over pions or lambdas over k-shorts. Um, in, at least in some momentum range. So, you know, say between uh, two and then four or five GV. Um, that was puzzling. Um, but um, if you know, and, and well, why is it puzzling? <clears throat> it's puzzling because if you think about string fragmentation, <clears throat> it's very hard to make baryons because you have to, if I go back here, right? Uh, um, you, you have to pop, sorry, you have to pop, um, diquarks out of the vacuum instead of quarks, and that is suppressed simply because they have a higher mass. And these tunneling formulas, they go exponential, so if you pop out something with a higher mass, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's it's suppressed, right? Um, <clears throat> and, uh, well, on the other hand, in recombination, oops, you would just take what's already there, and, uh, you know, so the three quarks that you need for a, for a baryon are already there. It's just a a matter of the sort of the competition between the two probabilities of them falling either in one potential, you know, with the with, with two quarks as a partner. Say if you if you start thinking about a single quark, does it prefer to fall into the potential with the other two quarks or into the potential with the anti-quark? But um, to make matters short, just to say, I mean, that's their competition is pretty equal, and that's why you know you can get in at least in certain momentum ranges as many protons as pions. So that revived this idea of recombination. And the other one, maybe more convincing, is uh, the scaling of elliptic flow. And uh, what, what is that? Well, so if, um, if you think about, <clears throat> if you think about, so elliptic flow is this deformation in momentum space, right? 
Um, and the question is, how does this, how is this translated or how is this uh, um, uh, imposed onto hadrons, right? So if you're, um, now let me argue with hydro, <laughs> why it cannot be hydro. Um, if you, uh, in, in hydrodynamics, uh, you would just be sensitive basically to the, to the mass of a, uh, of a hadron, right? And that would, that would completely determine its flow, its flow properties. And, uh, you know, it's kinetic energy given at a given temperature or average kinetic uh, energy at a given temperature at a given flow. Um, you shouldn't be sensitive to where that thing came from uh, you know, and, and how many valence quarks it has. Um, but then if you look at the phi meson, this is star data, the phi meson and the uh, the proton, or we have antiproton here, um, they actually have different elliptic flow, at least, you know, in, in some region, you might say, wait, wait, I mean, everything is on top of each other here. But look at what's plotted here is um, elliptic flow scaled by the number of valence quarks. And this is, this is actually um, basically kinetic energy, okay, transfers kinetic energy divided by the number of valence quarks, okay? So uh, if you have mesons and baryons, they have been scaled by different numbers. So since the phi and the antiproton are the same now, they were different before the scaling, right? So I didn't want to squeeze that plot on, but uh, you can see that you you can see that if you just look at V two versus PT or versus um, kinetic energy. So what does it mean? Well, it means that what you're looking at, at least that's the interpretation. If you believe quark recrimination is responsible for this, is that what you're looking at in the scale plot is actually the elliptic flow for the quarks just before sort of hydronization happens, right? And then there's a mechanism how this is translated into the elliptic flow of uh, baryons and mesons. For the baryons, um, you know, in a simple way, if you go through a ton of approximations, you can actually get out something like the scaling formula. You basically get three times uh, the flow for a baryon, you know, three times that of the quark, uh, twice that for the, for the meson, and it's also at three times the momentum, or, you know, that's easier to understand, right, why it's three times the momentum of the quark because it's roughly the momenta are shared between the valence, valence quarks. So three times the momenta for baryons, uh, twice the momenta for, for, for mesons, okay? So um, I, I don't really want to use that uh, here in this lecture at all, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, this was cool stuff that people discussed 15, 20 years ago uh, a lot, and it led to this revival of, um, of, the, uh, of this model, okay? And um, yeah, before we then actually go into the details of this particular model, let me maybe stop again for questions. Yes, somebody is writing a question, but uh, okay, it's not showing yet. So all right, let's give it a second. Yeah. yeah. And I have to. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, pop up. Uh, so uh, I have to. I have to. I have to speed up a little bit, right? Okay. All right. So in page fifteen, uh, can we expect a large enhancement if we take the oh, ratio of four? Yeah. So page fifteen. Uh, yeah. Can we expect a larger enhancement if we take the ratio of four quarks divided by two quarks? So yeah, four. Oh, quarks, four quarks. Uh, um, yeah, uh, tet so if you think about tetraquark states or something, right? Uh -huh. Maybe. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, in, so in principle, in, in principle, in principle, uh, in principle, yes. So everything that requires you to uh, to put together a larger number of quarks, uh, you know, than just two, like say a quark and an antiquark, I think well is always going to be. Um, uh, easier, it's always going to, to be easier in, in quark recombination, okay? Now, uh, so some of these states um, that maybe you're, uh, maybe you're thinking about cheta quarks and, and stuff like that, but um, of course it might be more complicated if, if it's say a molecular state, okay? So if it's, it's, if it's a true bound uh, cheta quark state, I think the answer is yes. If it's a molecular state where it's sort of in stages, you first make two mesons and then maybe, you know, you uh, there's a later stage in the hadronic phase, perhaps, where they form a molecule. Then it's it might be a little bit different, but um, yeah. So if it's a true data quark, the answer should be yes, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it's not um, it it's not in at least in hybridization right now to to make tetraquarks, by the way. So 
it's something that we can look at as an extension at some point. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or should I move on? Uh, no, I don't see any. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Um, I, I probably have to speed up a little bit. Um, okay. So, um, yeah. So, so now I want to talk a little bit about hybrid hybridization, which is sort of now um, a model that that is in Jetscape. It has sort of been developed over the last like uh, five, six years. And uh, basically the, the bottom line is, so we know that string fragmentation does an excellent job for dilute systems like E plus or minus or PP. But recombination does also, it describes a lot of aspects of heavy ion collisions. Um, but we want something that's comprehensive, right? We want a comprehensive model. So how about we combine them? And there's two ways of thinking about that. You could say, well, uh, going back to this plot of the Cornell potential, right? So you have sort of this long distance part that is very nicely described by um, by by string fragmentation, but you also have that Coulomb part, and let's apply recrimination to that Coulomb part. So if partons are sort of close together in phase space, then let them recombine if they want to. Okay, and um, and uh, yeah, so so we sort of want to have this, and uh, um, you know this, this sort of kind of um, um, schematics here where dilute sort of is you know. Basically everything that's not heavy ion collisions, right? And uh, yeah, so so those are the sort of the two limits. So you need some kind of cutoff between those uh, those two models, string fragmentation and uh, and recombination, and that can be naturally given actually by recombination probabilities because if things are far apart in phase space, recombination probabilities are naturally small. You know they 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 dive into you know to really small numbers so um it just naturally cut off cuts off um if you sort of limit the number of excited states that you can um that you can create and um, that's a natural cutoff right so here's sort of the flow diagram of of how this works so um the your input are partons um that typically still have some virtualities uh below some cutoff they come typically from shower monte carlos right um we do want space-time information. That is something that um, is sort of specific for heavy ion collisions because um, you know we 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 um, we we think that it makes a difference. Uh, you know, if a jet, you know, if if you have a hydro a jet goes through a hydro background, uh, we we hope at least it is sensitive to what is say the local temperature, right? The local flow field somewhere. If that's not true, we can sort of pack up and and go home. So. So there has to be space-time information, uh, which is not important really for, you know, E plus or minus or, or PP, but can be added there as well because, in principle, we know how to build up the space-time, um, the space-time information for a jet shower. And I'm, in fact, I'm going to show you some uh, some pictures later on, right? And we need color tags. Okay. So the next thing is a recombination step. Okay. So now we have all the partons. And you basically, you go through the list um, and form all the possible QQ bar pairs. I mean, uh, sort of their meson candidates and all the possible, you know, the candidates for baryons and antibarons. And you just compute what's the probability for them to recombine. For most of them, that will be very small numbers. You throw dice, right? You sort of sample these probabilities. And in the end, um, in that Monte Carlo, you know which ones will recombine, um, okay? And uh, I talk a little bit more about how these probabilities are calculated in another slide. So then you have some hadrons already, okay? But you also have some uh, are left with some uh, partons, quarks and antiquarks, and gluons if they have survived. If the if the quarks and antiquarks in, inside of gluons didn't want to, okay, inside of gluons sounds bad. So that, but as we discussed before, gluons are first sort of provisionally decayed into quark and antiquark pairs. Provisionally means that if none of the um, decayed orders wants to recombine. We put them together into gluons again, okay? And they can be nice, you know, kinks on strings. So, so these remnant hadrons, okay, they are in strings again naturally. Uh, if you have, you know, originally had color tags, um, because you only remove color tags when you hadronize, right? When you recombine, you you know those those things. I mean, the the color structure it will be diff, diff, different. It might it, typically it gets actually more complicated, but it's still a valid color structure. Um, and that, in a sense, you just you know, you, you make sure that Pythia can handle it. You give it to Pythia 8. That's the string fragmentation part. So that's how it really works. Now, um, 
the advantage, the big advantage um, um, that sort of hybrid harmonization has over pure string fragmentation, uh, which you can also do in, in, in Jetscape, is that it's easy. You know immediately how to uh, introduce a medium, right? So in addition to your shower partons, you also have sort of a diff an, another source of partons, and that's just the medium, so thermal partons. So you sample typically the T equals TC hypersurface uh, for these partons. You allow recombination between shower partons and thermal partons. Very easy, okay? You're using exactly the same uh, uh, mechanism. And then uh, if you're on, in the string, in, in sort of in the string stage, Again, strings can also connect to thermal partons. That's also allowed, okay? So you have recombination with thermal partons and you have strings into which thermal partons could have, um, you know, uh, could have built um, uh, uh, into. Uh, and uh, so you just let it run and you immediately get medium effects in your in your hydronization. Okay, so um, I, I think I will be short on this next part, which is sort of explaining a little bit the formalism. So. Let me just, um, for the recombination part, because I talked already about the string part a little bit um, and the recombination part. So that's something that has been worked out. Um, first, I think I have some references here. Let me actually go back. So the Reiner, first page. There are a few questions. Uh, oh, there are a few questions up on this. Okay, then yes. let's take questions at this point. Yeah. Okay, so, so there is one question in the chat, which is asking regarding the difference between a diquark and a meson. Okay. Okay. Um, well, so uh, a, a die quark really is a quark quark um, system. So it's not something that confinement actually allows, right? So it's only a, a construct in some intermediate step, uh, just like a quark itself uh, or a gluon. Um, but it's they're useful, for example, also to carry to carry sort of at least part of a barrier number. So. Um, uh, and, and just to make it uh, clear, so a meson is a quark anti quark bound state, right? So, um, so a di quark cannot be a color singlet, also. So, it's uh, it's two color it's two color triplets, which are then you get like a six sextet and an anti triplet. So, the anti triplet part you can put together with another quark, and then you see you have the two quarks in the di quark, and you have a single quark. So, that makes a baryon. So, di quarks are often used to sort of model. Baryons, uh, sort of that a baryon is a diquark and a quark. Okay, so in terms of yeah, so the the color structure is different. They they cannot be color singlets. Um, we don't really so Jetscape doesn't really do diquarks. Uh, let me also say that so Pythia can do that, but uh, any diquarks that might be in Pythia are not really taken over and handled in the framework right uh, sort of in the correct way right now. And and that's that's probably okay. Um, I don't think they're really that important to you know get sort of aspects right of what we what what we have. But in principle, they're there, and Pythia then internally uses them also to uh, to do the string fragmentation. So in that sense, they're indirectly there, but not really as Jetscape or Xscape framework objects. Okay, I hope that answered that yeah. question. And two questions from Slack. So one mm -hmm. is in string fragmentation, I saw the dicot pair is formed from the vacuum. So maybe when you saw a yeah. screen, show the string yes. string breaking, and then in yes, a similar yes. way, can baryons, for example, uh, proton and antiproton, can form from vacuum? Yes, yes. So that's right. So in this particular example, um, let me get my. So in this in this particular example, so you have this string, and uh, there must have been a lot of energy in this string because it breaks into a lot of. Uh, uh, QQ bar pairs, right? So, for example, here's a DD bar. Here, let me start from the top. It breaks into a DD bar. There's an SS bar, and then if you have enough energy, you could also. I mean, that's part of that Lund model. They say, okay, you can also form a, a diquark anti diquark pair, so a UD and a UD bar, and that's how you can additional can can get additional baryon anti baryon pairs during the string fragmentation, right? So the net baryon number is doesn't change. Because you always create a baryon anti baryon baryon pair, uh, you could think of them as carrying two thirds of a baryon number each, right? Or plus two thirds and minus two thirds. And indeed, you would get a what would it be? Actually, a lambda, right? An SUD and a, what is it? A U bar, so an anti proton, right? So in in this particular string fragmentation, um, net baryon number is fine. It's you know it remains to be it remains uh, at zero, but you have created uh, a baryon and anti baryon. 
So yes, so that's a way how uh, uh, how um, baryons can form. But um, I didn't put the formula here, but uh, the, the tunneling formula has some e to the minus the mass of what you pop out of the vacuum uh, squared over some string constant. So uh, they are suppressed because of the higher mass. So it's hard to do that, right? Um, okay, I hope that answered that question. And then another one is, uh, what is the difference between cluster hadronization and core classes? Ah, okay. Yeah, um, okay. So it, it's, it's a good question. Um, so there are, as I said, there are similarities, right? In particular, if you have, um, so the clusters typically are things that have not core, the, not the masses of hadrons, but they're really, um, th they are heavier than, than uh, you know, even excited hadrons, uh, even though, you know, maybe the, the regions, then there is some overlap between the regions. Um, there's also, I think there's no consideration of, um, there's no consideration of, um, Sort of wave functions for these clusters, so that they actually say, what's the probability of you know forming something that is a hadron from say a QQ bar, right? You just say, well, so you have these and they form a cluster. Uh, while in recombination, you always calculate a probability based on you know a, a particular model, like an interaction that that you have. Okay, and I'm actually going to talk about this. So. Um, other than that, there's there there are some similarities between the two. I I agree. So. Now, cluster hadronization enforces confinement by just clustering everything, okay? So the other thing with recombination is that recombination itself doesn't have confinement. You really, um, so if you want to, if you really want to enforce confinement, and that was a, um, you know, it, it wasn't really there in the first generation of recombination models that were applied, but that's another thing that string, the, the string part of hybridization actually does. It really cleans up, you know, it cleans everything on the board. Right, because stuff that is very far apart already in in phase space, because you know it's 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 it, it's just uh, you know uh, flown out. It has flown out from the interaction zone, you know, away, away from the hard process. Um, they will not recombine. Uh, the the probabilities are too small, uh, at least in this formalism. You know, if you if you want to be consistent, but there's always a string connecting um, you know a, a row quark to something else. So it will always be part of string fabrication. So I would say the way confinement is implemented then uh, in hybridization and in clusterization is also really different then, okay? But yeah, so that's why I said at the beginning, it's interesting to track what are similarities and, and differences between these models. So there definitely are some, some similarities. Okay, I hope that uh, explained that question. Anything else? Or should I move uh, on? We have an, we have another one, but uh, can be a wording uh, issue, so uh, we, we can handle it. So yeah, so please okay. continue. All right. yeah. Okay, yeah. So let me let me try to speed up. So so here's the workflow. I wanted to just quickly show, um, um, you know, so the, there is uh, there is a process behind calculating these um, these probabilities for recombination. The setup is very simple. So you assume a potential. Which uh, in in this case right now, what's implemented is actually harmonic oscillator potential, so just an R squared uh, uh, potential between a quark and an anti quark, um, and then you have two wave packets that, that sort of represent the quark and the anti quark, or if you do baryons, uh, you know you have to split it up and and make it a, the potential between uh, essentially a di quark and a quark, and within the di quark again, uh, you have the same potential sort of between the two quarks. Um, and uh, so based on that, and based on a phase space formalism of quantum mechanics, so the Wigner formalism, and uh, let me just again emphasize because it's um, it's not just momenta, but also positions are important in heavy ion physics. So that's why most people at least uh, who do recombination work in a phase space formalism. So doing that, you can actually compute, uh, let me skip this uh, probability. So, um, you know, there's no need in, in uh, really reading through these formulas. Let me just uh, explain that what is what is the parameters in the end. I lost my. Okay, I don't know where my. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, so uh, let me just explain what the parameters are. So in the end, you calculate probabilities, and they still depend on sort of the positions of the central the central positions of these wave packets. Okay. 
uh, basically the distance vector in coordinate space, the distance vector in phase space. Um, and, uh, you know, so you can design code in these two variables, V and T here. And all of these um, uh, probabilities depend on, on those two variables. Um, what are the indices here? The indices are the, um, the quantum numbers of the bound state. So the P00 would be the probability for the ground, for the, for the ground state. Uh, 01, for example, has, is a P wave. So there's an angular momentum um, excitation and, and so on, okay? Uh, let me skip the rest here. Uh, there's very beautiful physics that comes out of this in terms of like, when do a quark and an antiquark prefer a radially excited state versus an angular momentum excited states and so on. Um, let me just quickly talk about the string, um, what this does to strings, because this might be interesting. So suppose we have a string um, like this, where you have sort of a quark and an antiquark. So uh, the ones that are just colored outlines are antiquarks here. And there's three gluons, so it's it's very schematic here. The, the this is a string with three gluons, okay? QQ bar string with three gluons. I hope everybody sort of sees that. Um, the gluons have been decayed into QQ bar pairs, okay? So each gluon that that's sort of the uh, the circles that are attached to the gluons. <clears throat> so very schematic. But so suppose now you apply that recombination formalism and you roll dice and in your system now, say this anti-quark and this quark want to recombine. And by the way, so color, the color tags are also used. The wave functions are not just, uh, or the overlap probabilities for say a quark and anti-quark, not just com comes from the phase space, but there's also a spin part and a color part, right? Um, that are part of this uh, probability, the, you know, part of this overlap <coughs> probability that you, that you compute. And color tags are used for that. The information that we have, it's always a bit incomplete, but what the information we have, we use for that. Uh, so it could be purely statistical, or it could be, you know, if you already know two color tags are the same, then that part, the color, the color factor would sort of be one, right? So not, not uh, knock down the probability any further. So suppose these two partons recombine. Now, if you think through this, how this works in color tags, and I apologize, I don't think I have time to really explain to, uh, in, in detail, but you would get two remnant strings. So the this anti-quark and this quark are gone. And then sort of this uh, centerpiece is sort of a remnant string. And these two things would also snap together. So um, the bottom line is that because you only take out color singlets, naturally there's always a way all the remaining partons snap together into strings again. Um, the, the, the number of strings might change. Uh, you might get, if you recombine into a baryon, you will have an anti-junction there now in your string system because baryon number is conserved. Um, so I cannot go into the details, but um, let me just say that there's always a nice way of making a string system again, okay? And um, if you have medium partons, um, then um, there's a little bit more work because um, the thermal partons, they don't have color tags. So you have to, um, then color becomes statistical. Some of the shower partons also uh, don't have color tags. And if I don't say color tags, I mean they are set to zero. Um, and that's simply because if you interact with the medium, you also sort of uh, assume that uh, the color is randomized. So once you, once you touch the medium, uh, the color is randomized. I mean, once a parton interacts with the medium. So for example, LBT typically comes uh, with lots of color tag zero partons. And you can handle them and uh, sort of treat them in a, in a, in a similar way. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, let me let me skip the extra partons. Maybe that's not information that we need right now. Okay. Now you you know, can hand the remaining string system to Prithia eight. Um, you have several. You have two options for doing decays of excited particles. Uh, one is directly in Prithia, um, so it's sort of handled by hybridization itself when it calls Prithia. There are settings for that. Or there is in principle now there's going to be with the new version also. Uh, a, uh, an option to do those decays in smash, okay? Uh, but not just yet, okay? And um, so here's the plot that's with the, with the version that you're also going to play uh, today, uh, just to show you um, that um, indeed there is, um, um, there, there's sort of a, um, a separation for when is recombination more active and when is uh, fragmentation more active even in the vacuum. So this is sort of an E plus E minus system. And you see that these are just hadrons uh, that come out and you see that 
Uh, for large PT, and this uh, could go even, even further, um, string fragmentation is, is absolutely dominant. So it's a very dilute system with just you know, a handful of partons. Um, but at low momenta, sort of that's where the few partons that you have are sort of sitting, most of them, um, you do get contributions from recombination. Now, recombination wasn't really built or built into hybridization for that. We put it in, in there for um, to describe AA, jets in A, for example. But of course, you want to, be, want to be consistent, okay? So one of the challenges then is to say, well, if you do this, everything is, con is sort of self-consistent. Let's not screw up the good results that string fragmentation has in things like E plus E minus, right? And indeed, uh, you know, I think that goal is sort of met because um, the, the recrimination part is pretty, pretty inactive. It's there, but it's pretty inactive in E plus E minus, okay? So, and, and string, string fragmentation still dominates in the jet core where it's very dilute and the distances are huge in phase space, right? Okay, um, yeah, adding a medium, I, I maybe the only thing I want to say here is that uh, in Jetscape, um, if you run jets through a medium, you also have to deal with something that we call holes, which are basically, you keep the information of thermal partons that you've used um, during the runs, for example, in the LBT, and those can be, uh, th those can be um, processed and, and hydronized separately, actually, in hybridization. It's, it's like a background, right? So you've interacted with the medium, you've taken energy momentum out of the medium. You have to put that information also somehow into the soft sector, right? Or have some kind of means of tracking it uh, so that you can subtract it, you know, in terms of a background. And if you want to do the latter, then uh, you can uh, you can sort of keep track of these negative partons and they can be hydronized separately now. Okay, uh, space-time pictures. Uh, maybe the last thing really on, on the formalism. Um, I don't know. So most people never think of jets in space-time, right? What they look like. Uh, only in momentum space, uh, you know, with nice prongs and everything. And uh, so they, they really look like inverted, uh, in, inverted cones uh, in, in, in that case, all right? So the jet... So this is um, a transverse, an axis transverse to the jet. This is um, a time axis. So you see that most partons are, of course, uh, here. So these are the partons before hadronization, okay? Uh, and this is the vacuum. So this is just what, what matter would actually give you, which has space-time information, okay? Um, so the jet core sits, uh, of, obviously, at, at large momenta, so these also are propagating then along the, the, the jet axis, not, not very much into the transverse direction. So the core of the jet is probably along here. Um, now, if you add a medium, uh, so if you look at a jet in a, in a brick, um, the space-time the, the space situation is actually like this. So you don't have any partons, or you shouldn't have any partons inside the medium. So this is the medium that just sort of switches off, sort of falls below TC, at a time of four Fermi over C, okay? And uh, you have the jets sticking out of that. So jets, that, that's a property of high energy jets. They will basically always stick out of your uh, quark lumen plasma, okay? Um, and only that, that's when they finish their showering. Um, but also you have now all that stuff on the, on the surface here of the QGP. Those are partons that are, were sort of radiated earlier but they made it through the medium in some way and they're accumulating there now, they need to be hadronized. But also um, there are thermal partons available on that hypersurface, which also will, uh, these by the way are only the, the shower partons, so the, the thermal partons would be extra, okay? You also see the light cone by the way and, and uh, see that everything is okay with causality here in this picture, which is nice, okay? Um, so, so that's a space-time picture that sort of you have to work with with hadronization. Okay, uh, and it's important because the phase space information always has the space time information also in it. Okay, um, yeah, okay, let me not dwell on this more. If, if there's questions, you can also have the slides and you can still post uh, the monitor Slack. Uh, and, uh, you know, for the rest of the day, if you have questions, you can, uh, you, you can ask them here as well. Okay, so very briefly, um, how does this work now in hydrization in, in Jetscape? So you have three options, uh, which are called colored, colorless, and hybrid hydronization. Well, hybrid hydronization we talked already uh, about. 
Colored and colorless, we sort of also talked about because they are purely string fragmentation, okay? The difference is in, is in the way those strings are set up. It's either use the, um, the color tag information, that's colored anonymization, or completely disregard um, all color tag information and just rebuild strings using a metric of proximity in, in momentum space, okay? Never mind the details, but um, so yeah, so here's a little table that um, that sort of has a, a few of the properties here. Um, and uh, one should say that color hybridization is really only intended for vacuum systems like PP, okay? Because it needs color tags and there is just a lot of stuff about color tag coming out once you have a medium and you know once you run LBT and things like that. Um, and interactions with the medium, uh, so including thermal partons and therefore interactions with the medium during hydrization, they are um, they are only in hybrid, uh, really. Okay. So how do you choose this? Well, you choose it in your XML. Okay. So you can there's a, a jet hydrization section where you can choose colored, colorless, or hybrid. Uh, very simple. Um, I think Hendrik, who will uh, be part of the team uh, doing the hands-on session. Um, I think here in one of his posts here already said this, that this is sort of a beta version of what you're using here uh, at the school. Um, okay, it will be in the Chatscape 3.6 release. It's not yet official, so be a little bit careful about that. Um, there is, um, you know, lots of parameters that you can set. I think I will just skip that part, okay? Um, if there's questions during the, um, you know, if you have some time during the hands-on session because maybe you've done an assignment you want to come back to that and 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 ask me i'll be on slack um just ask a question about some of these other parameters that you can set about uh these hydrization models in the xml file okay and with that yeah let me just um uh, say um yeah i had a few result slides um for hybrid hydrization but um i think i'm going to skip that simply because it's late so um yeah, let me stop here. That that was really um, everything I had. And let me ask if there is more questions. Uh, both on Slack and Zoom, uh, I don't find any. Yeah. Okay. There, there is a question in the Zoom ah, chat. Right. How does uh, remaining uh, color tags are handled in colorless hadronization? Oh, so if there are color tags, then they're just ignored in colorless hadronization. So um, if you if you um, if you look, for example, at our proton uh, the proton proton paper that Jetscape has put out, um, so at that time hydrogen hydronization didn't exist in Jetscape. So, but we use both colored and colorless hydronization. So in one case, um, so the showers were done by matter, which has color tags. So in one case, these color tags are basically used to build the strings, and the other one they aren't. Um, it's sort of two extreme ways of thinking about this, right? Uh, like either preserve the color flow or don't. Um, so colorless, the, the results of colorless are also up there. Like, you know, uh, I don't think one could discern uh, necessarily from those observables. There's others that will be sensitive to color flow. Um, but uh, one could discern from that, uh, that, you know, which one is better. It At the time, it just gave us a nice sort of uncertainty, you know, some estimate of uncertainty coming from hadronization, right? But with colorless, you can do both in medium and uh, without a medium. With colored, you really you're um, you're sort of restricted to um, vacuum where you where, where you have proper color tags, like color tags that are not zero. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. And you will get an opportunity. So I think you will use both hybrid and colorless hydronization in the hands-on session today. Okay, I see no further questions. I would suggest that we have a 10 minute break so that, that people can grab a coffee or use the restroom and we reconvene for the hands-on session at 1040. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if there are more before, questions. Before we break, there is one more question. Five okay. On, yeah. on, uh, on Slack, I see. In the beginning, can you explain the SU3 with large N approximation a little bit? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. If, okay, let me go back here. 
Yeah, so in a sense, you add dimensions to your, uh, you know, it's a, instead of just the three directions for a quark, you have, uh, you, you just add more, okay? And uh, in terms of the, the algebra, really, I think one way of thinking about this, hold on. Uh, almost there. One more. Okay, so uh, one way of thinking about that, I think, is the following. So if you look at these Gelman matrices, the Gelman matrices really are sort of built from uh, from from um, from poly matrices, right? So the poly matrices like this, like this, they have these off diagonal structure, like one 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 here, you know, and then there's i minus i and so on. So this the, this off diagonal thing that that's basically that's sort of the color flip. Right, so uh, you go in, um, you go in maybe with uh, you know an index which is three here, and it becomes an index like the non, the, the one that is non-zero becomes the two index, right? So, so that's how you sort of the you the the color changes from, you know, very loosely speaking, how the color changes from say blue to red, right? I mean whatever index two and three corresponds to. But so now in a sense, what you do is you build much larger matrices. Right, similar to the Gelman matrices, that are also based on these uh, on these uh, on, on these poly matrices, sort of, right? So you add more, you know, for each new color tag that you create, you add another row and another column, and you add another, you know, one of these off diagonal sort of poly like structures. So now you you go in with a you know with a color tag, and it needs to flip, but it flips into a a new one, which which actually hadn't been here, been there, right? So you sort of add another. Uh, an, another line there. So that's one way I think of um, thinking about the algebra that replaces that replaces this. Okay, um, and you you do lose um, some you you do lose correlations, right? Because um, if you just add color tags, so you start say with a color tag one hundred or something, uh, you create twenty new color tags, right? So there would be like twenty new dimensions in that in in the SU three space. You know your your twentieth that you've added. It really is some linear combination of of actually just some other one. So the overlap would not be zero, right? But you treat it sort of as 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 being zero at at that point. Um, uh, you know the overlap between those two directions. So um, yeah, so so that's that's basically what uh, what's behind that. Uh, there is. Um, yeah, so this uh, this is based on maybe that's I should also mention that one more time. So this is based on the one of these Lesouche uh, accords where you know people figured out that that is sufficient sort of information, uh, sort of sufficiently simple. I mean, you want to simplify the algebra, and this is sufficiently simple to still track uh, color singlets um, and and build things like junctions. Okay, so is that does it answer the question? Um, and it doesn't it doesn't touch the color factors that you can use for your you can still use the the correct color factors if you know implement some PQCD cross section. So this is really then a way later on to you know to keep track of directions in color space for hadronization. Okay, so we really need to break. Uh, we will start our hands-on session at ten forty five am Eastern time in ten minutes. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Reiner. Really appreciate your presentation. All right. Okay, we are taking a break. See you in the hands on session. Yep.
All right, it is time for part two of this morning session, namely the hands-on training. And I'm gonna turn it over to Hendrik, I believe, who is gonna be running that part of the program. Cameron will start with the first part. Uh, yeah, I'll be handling the uh, vacuum system first. We'll be running uh, E plus E minus and then uh, brick. So um, Heinrich had put out a notification yesterday, I believe, about running the simulations that are listed in the readme following those instructions. So uh, was everybody able to get that done beforehand? Uh, Hendrik, do you have the Google Doc to see if everybody was able to get through that? At the moment, there's one person who did everything, including all the simulations. Uh, okay. Uh, should we just do a rock uh, walk through of getting everything run then? Yeah, now there are a few more persons. Ah, who right. did? Oh, we'll give it a bit to give people time to. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna share the one of the XMLs that you're uh gonna have run. Oh, screen sharing is disabled. Um. Well, if you go to the directory for uh hybrid hydronization. Uh, for the hands-on for today. And you go to the directory for XML files, you'll see the uh, Jetscape user uh, E plus E minus XML or EPEM. Uh, Raga, and you can scroll can you, through that to see all of Can you make Cameron co-host so that he can share his screen? Hold on, working on it. Um... I think Cameron shows his co-host now. Try again. Mm -hmm. uh, let me try. Share screen. Oh, what do you know? There it goes. OK. There it goes. So um, everything up here is just standard Jetscape XML. You're setting the number of events. You're setting the output file name. You're setting what kind of writer you want. We're only keeping the final state hadrons here. Um, this is selecting what hard process we're doing. This is the E plus E minus gun. Uh, the E loss modules, we're just making, we're using matter. We don't have anything like LBT because this is the vacuum system. And then this is mostly what we're concerned with for today. This is the hadronization model. We're using hybrid hadronization. ECM for hadronization is used when we have partons, uh, like constituent particles in our beams because E plus E minus doesn't have constituent partons. We don't worry about this. I believe this was updated to be set automatically for proton beams, so you don't have to configure it automatically, or you don't have to configure it manually anymore. But before, what you'd have to do is you have to set this to be a sixth of the beam energy, because six partons. Um, let's see. These are whether or not the Pythia decays are allowed. Like if you have excited state hadrons, if you can decay them down. This sets the lifetime for those particles that are decaying. Basically, any particle with a lifetime shorter than this time will be allowed to decay. And then this is uh, recombination hadrons and pythia. So ideally, everybody will have ran all of this up through uh, the part where we actually start using the notebooks. Um, so. This is just getting the LBT table set up for the brick. This is just adding in the hybrid hydronization files to the Xscape uh, directory. And this is installing the Python package that actually will read in Jetscape data and do the analysis. Um, this is running, this is the, this is the run we're concerned with right now. Uh, just the E plus E minus Jetscape run. 
Uh, Hendrik, does it look like everybody's got that done? Yes. Okay. So to actually access everything, you just copy this command and you want to run it in the Docker. And you have to run it from inside the Jetscape Docker because if you don't, then you won't have the necessary dependencies and you'll get a whole bunch of random Python errors because libraries won't be configured properly. So throw that in there and it starts the server and then you can access it like how you would normally do. So. Um, that should bring up the uh, appropriate directory. You can go to summer school, July 27th, hatchetization. Actually, I will probably switch my the screen I am sharing to the appropriate one. All right. So if you start in the root directory of the Docker container, you just go to summer school, July 27th, notebooks. And then we're concerned with this one here. So this first uh, cell right here is just importing everything that we're going to need um, and setting a whole bunch of matplotlib uh, parameters so everything's formatted the same. This is just the dat file that was created with the initial XML. Uh, then this is reading it in with that SparkX um, package that uh, was imported from uh, with pip. And then we uh, just trim down the particle list uh, with this step here. And this is just defining the number of events that are being used. So if you run this one, run this one. Uh, then it moves on to actually doing calculations. So Sphericity and aplanarity are event variables that E plus E minus is often concerned with. Um, like if you're looking at ALIF data, they'll often have a sphericity cut to make sure that their event is well contained inside the detector. So that's all this is going through. Uh, there's a tensor that you define from summing up all of the momenta of the constituent particles in the event, like the final state particles, that is. Um, and then there's three eigenvalues for this tensor, and you can get uh, two notable values, which is sphericity and aplanarity. A very spherical event is going to have high sphericity, and a very flat like event is going to have a high aplanarity. So this block is just defining all of the functions needed to calculate these. This is the one that extracts all the momenta, so you can do this momentum sum. This one defines QP. This one actually defines the momentum tensor. Uh, these compute the sphericity and air planarity. And this one actually computes the uh, tensor quantity. So it makes the tensor, then spits out the eigenvalues and returns everything you're interested in. So you run it, and it gets all that defined. Oh, please zoom in a bit. Sorry. OK, so this actually makes the Q plot. So if you run this, it will print this out to uh, qplot.pdf, and it'll look like this. So there are three notable regions here. So in this corner, we have back-to-back -back events. So they have low sphericity, but like decent, like some aplanarity. What this corresponds to is just two jets shooting out back to back. Um, up here, we have planar events. So these are events where everything happens like in a flat plane, but it's not necessarily back to back. So if you have three jets, for example, that all shoot out in the same plane, that will be something over here. And then over here, we have the uh, high sphericity events. So as we go up in S, as it approaches one, it gets more spherical. So this is, these are just common uh, observables that you'll calculate for events if you're doing E plus E minus stuff. Um, the multiplicity distribution is also generally pretty important. Uh, both like ALIF and OPAL data sets for E plus E minus are concerned with multiplicity. So uh, what this does is we just load in the simulation data from the hadronization data using SparkX. 
And then what this does is it removes uh, a whole bunch of particles from the list. So when we say like remove particle species 22, we're removing all of the photons because they're not charged. So it just saves on having to run through everything because you're not going to see them anyways in your multiplicity. Um, then we select for charge particles only. And uh, this just computes the multiplicity for a given event. Uh, this uh, just makes all the histogram stuff for it. So if you run this block, it'll go ahead and make the multiplicity graph at uh, this file. So everything that you're running is going to be saved to a PDF. So it'll exist after the notebook is run and everything. This block here is just a generic PT spectrum. First, we do it for all the hadrons. And then we're going to do it for kaons only. So this is just the method that returns everything. First, we're introducing particle cuts. So this is a pseudo rapidity range, but basically make sure you're not going too close to the beam pipe because often data sets will exclude stuff that's very close to the beam line because the detector isn't going to have good resolution there. Uh, so load in the data again. Uh, recombination hadrons, uh, we're removing gammas, we're setting charged particles only, and then we're using a PT cut of 0 0.2 GeV and above. So that's what this part is doing here. And then we're doing a pseudo rapidity cut for the pseudo rapidity range that we've defined. And then we're also doing a particle status cut. So what this, what this particle status cut does is it only uses uh, ones with uh, 11 or 12 tag, which means recombination only. So this way we can compare our recombination hadrons to our fragmentation hadrons, although the ones that come from the, like the uh, coalescence and the ones that come from string fragmentation. So the nice part about the Spark X package is that to just get particle cuts, you could just keep chaining these things together. It's like, okay, remove these, only charge particles, PT cut, pseudo rapidity cut, and uh, particle status cut, which makes it very convenient. Um, so we have three separate um, spectra here. First, our recombination only, then our fragmentation only, and then everything combined. So if you run this and this, it should make all the plots that you need. So uh, this plot will put three things on top of each other. So you'll be able to see both the uh, recombination and the coalescent or recombination and the fragmentation hadrons, and then compare that to the sum of the total. I'm actually going to switch screens so I can show that to y'all real quickly. Uh, All right, so what you get should look something like this, where you have your recombination and string fragmentation uh, both under your total. We'll see that uh, string fragmentation tends to dominate as you go up much higher in PT, whereas uh, recombination is more relevant at lower PT. Um, that's generally to be expected because recombination is easier for lower energy objects. Also, sorry, I have to keep bouncing back and forth between windows. I just can't run the, you can't run the Docker in the VS code or run the Docker, the uh, Jupyter Notebooks in VS code. All right. And moving on. Uh, so once you have all of that done, it's made the multiplicity graph. Uh, we do the same thing with chaos. So this is almost the exact same thing as what we did as before, except we're going to have a particle species cut where we only take kaons, so, which is this right here. So what this does is it selects only kaons out of that particle species list or out of that particle list that we made before. And once again, we do our recombination, we do our string fragmentation, and then we do our combined hadrons. So. There is a um, uh, you, from Slack. So is there a way to run in this notebook outside of the Docker? Um, it is 
difficult to. I tried running it outside the Docker to make it easier for me, and I wasn't able to get it to work. I would, you can pip install all of the Python packages that you will need uh, on your own, like on your local machine. But the issue is that you might not have like all the dependencies for FastJet installed correctly, which means uh -huh. you'll get a weird error buried in. Like I got something where one of the uh, hadrons, when it was being read in, it didn't recognize something as a number which is a bizarre error. I wasn't sure how to troubleshoot, so I just ran everything in Docker. But if you are dedicated to it, you can probably just keep pip installing packages every time you get an error until it works itself out. So if, if you get it working like that, it's definitely more convenient. Um, okay. Okay, and then this is just making the plot for the K-on spectrum, which will look much the same as before. Okay, um, now we're doing the jet analysis. So uh, this is done using the fast jet uh, algorithm, which is implemented through the Spark X uh, Python package, which is part of what makes it very convenient. So we load everything in. Our, first, we create like this jet analysis object. Then we uh, initialize the algorithm we want it to do. So uh, we're giving it the particle list that we have set from before. We're defining a jet radius that we want, an ADA range for these jets. Uh, then we're setting a PT range for them. So like PT 10 and above. Uh, we're uh, creating the file name that everything's going to be spat out to because it needs this intermediary file. And then we're defining the algorithm we want, which is uh, an E plus E minus uh, anti KT algorithm. Uh, you have to specify for E plus E minus specifically that you want the E plus E minus one. Oh, sorry, I had a fly. Um, because the E plus E minus anti KT algorithm is different than the uh, regular one you'll use for like proton proton or uh, heavy ion collisions. Then once this has been done, you read in the data from this uh, DAT file that's been made. And uh, then you just run this to get all the jet data from it. Uh, then you can get the associated particles out like that's uh, part of these jets. So like this is the constituent particles for every jet. And then this is uh, getting all the energy for every jet. So if you run this, then we're creating a jet energy spectrum. This is pretty standard, just plotting all the energies of all the jets. And it will uh, spit out something that looks like this. I have to switch windows again. All right. And you'll get something that looks like this where it kind of peaks around in this middle range and then it falls off as we get beyond what it's actually able to like put out in a single direction. So this is what we would expect to see, right? Um, now, this is a little bit different than how uh, experimental uh, jet plots are gonna look because experimental jet plots are gonna have different event cuts thrown in there. And also they're gonna have uh, different like particle selection cuts for how they build their jets. But this is roughly the same as what you'll expect to see. Um, as part of the homework, actually, because there's a thing called die jets, which are very important for E plus E minus analysis, it'll be uh, like seeing if you can find both the leading jet and the subleading jet for e events and only plotting those, which that should give is a more grouped uh, jet energy distribution. All right. I think we went through that a little fast. Uh, are there questions on going through the E plus E minus notebook? Okay, right, maybe it's good we went through it fast because I think the brick notebook has more to it. Uh, if there aren't any questions, Heinrich, do you want to start with the uh, Burke Notebook then? 
is everybody caught up? I mean, has everybody run this successfully? Maybe we should uh, check. There's still someone running the E plus E minus simulations, as it seems. Um, ah, okay. One person was not able to start the Jupyter notebook inside the Docker. Okay, I think we did get a question about that. So, um, was that the person who uh, wasn't uh, able to actually like get Jupyter notebooks running or accessed inside their Docker container? Yes. Um, I guess. Uh, okay. So maybe we do pause just for you know, maybe two, three minutes if there's still some people are still working on this. We can take some questions if there are any. Also about the physics of what all of this is about. Uh, I should probably say um, we sort of deliberately took two systems for the hands-on session that we thought would probably not be covered in any of the other hands-on sessions. Um, that's E plus E minus, and that's uh, just... Um, uh, a jet in a brick, which is sort of a model for, you know, heavy ion collisions or jets in heavy ion collisions. So maybe some of the setups might not be as familiar to some of you. So if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask in Slack or... Um... If, you, if you want to look at the jet output data file, it actually looks like this, where what it does is it spits out... Uh, a list of the first thing that it spits out as a jet, which is the zero index. And then everything after that are all the constituent particles. And then once you see this zero again, that's the start of the next jet where these are all the jet properties. Like uh, this is the PT, this is the momentum information. This is the energy. And this is the uh, event index. So if you're working with this uh, SparkX package, this is how you can actually parse this file. These are not all the jets for a given event labeled. These are all the particles for this first jet. That's this header right here. I did not realize that at first, and it made it difficult for me to understand what was going on. So when we take the uh, like jet of a sixth or seventh element of it to get the energy, that's this thing right here that we're taking, which is corresponding to the energy. Uh, hold on one second, just answering a troubleshooting question. I think I found the mistake. Um, so in the instructions okay. of the um, summer school to set up the Docker container in the Linux part, there was this minus P flag missing. Um, okay, that's what it and was. Without that, one cannot use the link created uh, by the Jupyter minus notebook command. Then one gets a 404 error or something like this in the in the web browser. Okay, that would make sense. Oh, I think they had already added that flag. Okay, maybe let's get Ajita another minute or so to uh, try to run that before we move on. The floor is still open for other questions. <laughs> So here's just something that I was thinking about when uh, um, 
Cameron talked about the, the Q plot, which is something that in heavy hand physics, we usually never really think about that, I guess. Um, well, you, you can actually, I think there's some, some attempts to, uh, to look at uh, sphericity in for the bulk of heavy ion collisions, probably. But um, so um, you can see that indeed the majority of events here are very, I mean, what we sometimes call pencil-like. So they're all in this in this one corner where um, you know basically um, yeah it's basically two back to back jets. Now, as Cameron pointed out, indeed, if you have um, a three jet event, it tends to be like planar. And it should be sort of, I think it's indeed the upper corner. And um, there's one, yeah. almost, yeah, there's almost nothing there. And the reason is that the Prithia, at least with the settings that we have, it's it's just leaning order. There isn't really any any true three jet events. Um, so um, I, I think that's more it's a reflection of, yeah, it's, it's, it's more a reflection of, uh, you know, the hard process. Um, you know, how that is modeled. Um, yeah. But in the any case, so... is much cleaner than it is in PP. So you don't get nearly as much like scattered everywhere. Sure. There's no underlying event in the, in that sense. Yes. As well. So really just, so all of these jets are, all of these events are basically pretty clean back to back jets. Yeah. Okay. Just a thought that Something I had that like, you'll on that plot. See. Yeah. Something you'll sometimes see is a cut on the sphericity axis where they first calculate the sphericity and then they find the axis through that, um, like through the event that it's like sphere or like has some symmetry about. And then they'll uh, do a cut on that to make sure that these back-to-back -back events are well contained within the uh, like detector's good range. So that's an right. another reason right. for calculating these. Not necessarily to measure it, but to cut on it. Right. So you can use it to make sure that uh, these two those two jets are really in uh, in your detector. Yeah. Um. All right. How are we looking? There's no change in the Google document, but I think we have to move on to the second notebook. Yeah, okay, then let's get okay. started, Hendrik, yeah. Hopefully people can catch up still. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Uh, yes. Okay. So I will first go um, through the XML files, or at least one of them. They are pretty similar. For some reason, my laptop is lacking a bit. Sorry, it's not working. Oh. You were frozen there for a little while, Hendrik. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my laptop is pretty frozen at the moment, so <laughs> okay. I can't do anything. Um, 
maybe Cameron, can you open the, the latest version of the notebook and share it? I, I think uh, it's yeah. not working. Uh, let me moment. share my screen real quick. Um, let's see. Actually, let me do what you were doing where you had that, uh, like both things open side by side. That would probably work better. Uh, um, let's see, where is Zoom? Uh, share screen. All right. So uh, the brick analysis notebook is uh, just going to look like this. It's going to start the same thing where we import everything. Uh, actually, Hendrik, do you want to take this? Uh, I'm. I don't see anything. My laptop is still lacking, so maybe I will just shut it down for one second and then join the meeting again. Okay, I'll start walking through all the preliminary stuff then. Okay, thank you. All right. So first, let's actually go through all the XMLs. Um, it's much the same thing at first, where these are like the number of events that we're going to be running. This is the file name, what kind of writer we want. Um, uh, Kevin, sorry, is there a way to uh, make it larger? Um, I have some trouble sorry, seeing it. I have a small that. screen, but maybe others too are on a small screen where this is. Uh, um, yeah, I forgot small. I have a very large monitor. Uh, let's see, if we can go to view. Um, parents. There we go. There we go. Okay. Let's yeah. Do it. Okay. Oh. Windows, please. Thank you. Okay. This should be big enough. Okay. Um, so. First, uh, we're actually using the Parton gun instead of a regular hard process. What we're doing with this is we're just taking a Parton and shooting it through a brick of like hot nuclear matter instead of like actually doing a collision. Because we're not actually interested in the full collision. We're just interested in how this one Parton is going to shower and then hadronize. So it's like a little test bed for the hadronization process. For the energy loss modules, first we use matter and then LBT. LBT is uh, necessary for doing all of the in medium stuff, like it handles the medium. Uh, this is the hydro module we're calling, and uh, this is setting the fact that we're using a brick, which is just you know that like hunk of medium instead of the actual collision that's producing it. And then the hadronization module. So this is a colorless uh, hadronization because first we're doing it with colorless so we can compare it to this one, which is the hybrid hadronization one. So the only difference between this XML and this XML is that we're using hybrid hadronization in this one. So this is so we can compare the directly colorless versus hybrid. Then the purpose of this XML is, uh, let's see, where's the size of the brick that we define. Well, the purpose of using this XML is, is we double the size of the brick so we can see the difference between uh, the hadronization results when you have a much larger medium. Because ideally you should pick up much more from the medium when the medium is larger. So this is a hybrid hadronization baseline where we do the same thing, but with no medium. And this is a colorless hadronization baseline where we once again do the parton gun, but with no medium. So these are vacuum runs. Uh, Heinrich, uh, you are reconnected. Yes, I'm back. <laughs> so I have a question. Where's, okay. the, where's the brick size set here? I see the temperature setting, but it's the brick size is, um, I don't see right now. It's in the energy loss. Oh, it's in the okay. Oh, it's in the energy loss. Uh, brick length. There it is. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So, because that's important, right? Because we have two Fermi three. and four Fermi. Yeah. Yeah. So this is four, and the other one it's uh two. So everything is as it should be. Okay, then we can go on to the notebook, maybe. So yeah, the first cell is basically the same as in the E plus E minus analysis. Then um, 
the second cell has all the paths to the data files we have created in the simulation runs um, together with the um, PT range we want to use for the spectra and the number of events we have simulated. Okay, then yeah, I should I probably run all run these. Um, then, yeah, there's a function to create a spectrum. So we use, again, the Sparks package, the, the histogram class of it. Um, and for each event, which contains all the hydrons, we um, just append the PT values of each of these hadrons to the uh, histogram. And then we use the, um, the statistical error function of this uh, package to compute the, the error bars in the y direction. We normalize by the number of events and uh, there's a factor of two pi times uh, pt dpt in this case. Um, and yeah, we then um, there are two additional functions to, to compute the error of the um, spectrum which we get in the end when we uh, subtract the negative hadrons so um, we we just t uh, compute one spectrum for the positive for for the real hadrons and then uh, one other spectrum for the negative hadrons uh, which we hadronize in the hybrid hadronization routine separately and then we just subtract the negative hadron spectrum from the positive one this is just to to get the error of this subtracted spectrum okay and then we can go to the next cell um which is pretty similar to the plus and minus um notebook where we just um yeah prepare some some jetscape uh, object um where we read in the file and then we remove again the photons the um, uncharged particles, so we just keep the charged ones, then um, if you can go a bit to the right, maybe. Oh, to the right. Uh... Yes. Okay, and then we see again this particle status, so in the first case we take all of the hadrons produced in uh, hybrid hadronization. Oh. Then in the second case, we just take the ones from recombination. The third case is then string fragmentation. And then the other three cases with the negative uh, particle status is um, for the negative hadrons. And then we just use this create spectrum function, which we have defined above. And in the next part, we um, subtract the negative hadron spectrum from the positive hadron spectrum, um, which are the, the three blocks at the bottom. And then in the next cell, we do the same for the four Fermi brick. Maybe you can run this already because this takes a few seconds and also the four Fermi one. Which is the same, just a different path. And the next cell is then for the colorless hadronization, where we don't have these negative hadrons. So we just, and, and we don't have to distinguish between string fragmentation and recombination. So there's just one uh, sort of hadrons coming out, so to say. And uh, we create a spectrum for that as well. And then we can simply plot all the spectra um, with this, which is done in the next um, cell. So first we plot the two Fermi uh, hadron spectrum for the charged particles. And in this notebook, we don't perform any uh, pseudo rapidity cut, for example, because this does not really make sense in the in the brick setup. The, jet is just going into the x direction and we have some 
some brick length um, of the medium. Um, so we, we don't really have a experimental setup in the sense that it's a real collision medium or so. Okay, on the right, yeah, we can already see the um, the plot there. So we have a recombination, um, which is dominant for the for the low PT, and then it's suppressed for the high PT part of the spectrum. But it's still there. And if we go to the, this is now two Fermi. If we look at the four Fermi. we can see that there's more recombination going on in the low PT part. Okay, and then, yeah, there's another plot for the two Fermi uh, brick in colorless hadronization, but this is just, just one line for completeness. Uh, we don't compare it to anything here. Okay, then, Ah, yeah, okay. Now we um, look at the fraction of uh, recombination in the um, in the two bricks of the di different length in the um, hybrid um, hadronization, um, where we just take the ratio of the two uh, computed spectra. And yeah, on the right, we can now see that um, yeah, for the larger brick, there's more recombination going on in general, but specifically at the low PT part of the, uh, on the left side. Okay, and then we have a comparison of the um, two Fermi bricks in hybrid and colorless hadronization. Um, and for this direct comparison, we are not removing the negative um, spectrum from the positive one so that we can directly compare um, the two spectra. And we see again that, um, yeah, we get more particles in the low PT region here for the hybrid hadronization compared to colorless. Then we can- Hendrik, could, yeah? could I make a quick physics comment here that uh, it, it would sort of fit here. Um, maybe even the, the previous plot. Can you, Cameron, can you go back to the previous plot? Um, uh, yeah, the, the yeah, combination the, hadrons? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's good enough. So, um, so since, so, this is a brick and not a real heavy ion collision. Um, and uh, so it simulates, so this particular brick that I've chosen simulates sort of uh, the fact that there is thermal partons in a medium, but what it doesn't do, at least in this setup is it, uh, it is, there's no collective motion of that quark gluon plasma, right? So uh, in a real nuclear collision, um, all of these sort of, fluid cells, uh, if you want to describe them by fluid dynamics, are sort of moving with, with great speeds to the outside. And um, the radio flow, there is actually an option in the brick to add flow uh, if, if you want to, but it's not done here. So the point I want to make is simply that, um, so here it looks as if recombination is only like important for, you know, basically the first two bins or maybe first three bins, maybe two to three GV. Um, and that's simply because the thermal the thermal momenta that that's the region you know that is accessible if you just have thermal momenta if you have radial flow that goes out further right so it will um it goes out to five six gv um for uh for baryons and maybe uh, sorry for, for mesons and maybe a little bit further for baryons um so just that as a as a side comment i had actually in in my slides i can actually say on which uh on which uh sorry let me just go there um i can tell you that on my slides uh one of the things that i skipped um actually on page let me see where is it page 35 
you can see uh, plots that give you a little bit of an idea of what flow can do in terms of, you know, shifting uh, these kind of things to larger momenta to what is called the intermediate momentum range. Yeah. Okay. Um, Henry, go ahead. Sorry. I thought that was maybe a worthwhile comment to make. No problem. <laughs> okay. So then uh, in the next step, we compute the ratio of the spectra with the brick divided by the spectrum uh, of the vacuum baseline uh, we have simulated. Oh, this one? Yes. Okay, and there we see that for large PT, we have a ratio of one, uh, basically, and at low PT, we have an enhancement of the um, particles there. So um, that's what Rainer has shown already, also in the lecture. Um, and then in the next step, we go into the... Um, yeah, origin of the hadrons a bit deeper. So um, we load the particle data again. And now we just load particles with status 11, 12, 21, or 22, which uh, correspond to, um, so the the first with, with the 11 and 12, they come from the recombination. Once with the, with the, re, uh, with the shower, I, shower shower uh, partons then 12 is shower thermal uh, 21 is then fragmentation from uh, shower and shower and 22 is fragmentation from shower and thermal partons and then we can just create some histograms for each of this uh, particle uh, data and um, yeah, then stack them together in one plot. Um, uh, you have to execute the next cell as well. It actually creates two plots for the two and four. Uh, so, uh, Hadron Origin, oh, there's yeah, something there's just got added. Where was that? There it is. Okay, yeah, there you see for the two Fermi brick, the, the fraction of the hadrons coming from the different um, different processes. So the recombination hadrons from the shower, they are pretty constant around the 20%. Then you have at low PT this um, recombination hadrons which come from shower plus thermal partons, um, which make up just a tiny fraction of the whole. And then the, the fragmentation takes over most of the um, hadrons. And um, yeah, so that's- Something I do just want to note. Yes. The only reason this is as spiky as it is is because we only ran a thousand events. If you dump statistics into this, this will all smooth out into like a much smoother proportion. Yeah, so if you want to run like 10,000 events or so, then then you will see that this smoothens out and uh, looks much nicer in the end. Um, but with the given data set, this is not possible. Um, okay, and then maybe show the four Fermi now. And there we see that the recombination um, of shower and thermal partons is now increased for the very low PT. Uh, region and the fragmentation um, hadrons from shower shower partons, they uh, this is decreased here. Okay, and then yeah, we have two homework exercises. Mm -hmm. The first one, Hendrik, is, can I yes. can I make a, another physics comment before we sure. move on 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 these plots? Yeah, um, might be worthwhile. So because there's an, there's also the the fragmentation with a thermal parton. Which is actually the majority. I mean, sort of the you know sixty percent here. Um, uh, so that that is um, so. Why is that uh, contribution so strong? It's because we start out always with a 
a system that is not a color singlet, right? So it's a single quark. That's a, the, the P gun gives you a single quark. It's not a color singlet. So what you have to do, um, and colored and colorless have to do similar things. I mean, if, if they're not given color singlet systems, you have to add what we call an extra parton. It could be a beam parton. I, I skipped over that because of lack of time in my slides, but there's some comment there also that you can look up. So it could be a beam parton. It could be in a medium, uh, a thermal parton. Um, or it could be you know, even something else. But in this case, because we're in a medium, uh, if you think about it physically, there's sort of a string which doesn't have an end point, right? It wants to snap onto something. It will grab a thermal parton. So because you start out with something that's not a color singlet, there's always at least one string which will end up having one thermal parton. And at least, you know, uh, a, a, as soon as it has one thermal parton, it is labeled a, a string with a thermal parton. So, and that's the yellow stuff. So. In a sense, it's a bit of an artifact that that contribution is so is so large, right? So maybe uh, one could come up with a nicer, I don't know, with a more meaningful way of counting that. But the main point here is sort of to see if you if you disregard this, the main point is to see how going from two to four Fermi, and of course you could have more points sort of on this uh, um, on on this if if you think about this as a you know. An x-axis where you increase smoothly increase the size of the medium, uh, you could have more points. Uh, the point is that it uh, the contribution of recombination with the thermal that involves thermal partons increases. Okay, and if you were to go to a six Fermi medium or more, it would be even larger or eight Fermi. I mean, we've run as large as eight Fermi. So, okay, thanks, Hendrik. Go on. Okay, yeah. So for the first homework task. Uh... This one is pretty easy. So you basically copy over the um, the things from the plus e minus notebook and run the jet analysis. And now you don't have to specify the um, jet finding algorithm anymore because the standard algorithm used in the package is the KT algorithm, uh, the anti-KT algorithm. Um, that's the first thing and maybe just to show you how it will look like, then. Oh, do I need to stop the screen share? Compare. I I just put it in the in the Slack uh, channel, so everyone can have a look at that. Um, and yeah, the second homework is not that specified, so uh, you can uh, just play around with the parameters and see what is the effect. So change the brick length, make it larger, then of course you will have more thermal partons and um, the simulation will take longer or change the temperature of the brick, see what effect this has. Um, maybe also on the jet um, part you have uh, done in the homework exercise one. Um, and what I did, for example, is I ran a brick with four Fermi and uh, changed the brick temperature to 300 um, MeV, and I will also put that plot in the Slack channel. Um, and if you go there, you can see that um, the fraction of the um, recombination hadrons from um, shower thermal uh, partons is increased, and um, that the Fragmentation hadrons from uh, shower shower partons are um, yeah decreased at the low PT region, for example. But you can you can simulate your your favorite uh, brick setup and and change the parameters and play around with this. And yeah, if you have some results at in the end, then uh, please post them in the Slack channel. That's from my side. Are there any questions? So maybe I can add um, two things. I think uh, um, when Cameron went over the XML file, we didn't really point out the temperature, but there's a very obvious parameter in the in the brick uh, that I think is just called T exactly. So that's how you set the temperature now. To be more specific, this is the temperature um, sort of for the energy loss uh, modules, okay? 
um, the because at the the thermal partons for the for the hydrogenization they're always at you know at TC sort of sampled at TC, but that's uh, what you would have to change if you want to run it with three hundred MeV. So this is the temperature in GV here. And um, yeah, otherwise I think we'll just we'll monitor the Slack channel, um, you know, today and and probably also tomorrow. So if you have uh, um, any results that you want to share, any questions, um, feel free to post. All right, thank you. So, Stefan, we have another like a, a general Q and A session. I don't know if there are questions, but uh, should we okay there open up the floor one more time? Yeah. Anything about the lecture or about the hands-on session? I don't see any. Everybody, this is your last chance to ask questions. None. Okay, well then, thank you everybody. Uh, I uh, wish you all a good rest of your day and the last day of the Jetscape school is going to be tomorrow. Particularly, all thank right. you to all the speakers. Thank you. All right. Okay, everybody. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Adios.